Welcome everybody to the Tag Your Podcast. I'm Ray Ray. And I'm Dave. And this is show number two today, which is yes. great. And I'm glad we had an amazing guest on before this. And we are excited to be here. This is a topic that we have not covered. We have been, of course, podcasting over 160 episodes. Yeah, but something like that. But we have not ever talked about what is a Christian worldview. Yeah, so we have spent a lot of time talking, talking about, about things... From yeah. a Christian worldview and uh, saying things like, if you don't have a Christian worldview, then you can't make sense of certain things and whatever. But we have not just like sat down and talked about the fundamentals of a Christian worldview. Well, and this in idea for sixty uh, in three yeah. years. And this idea yeah. came to me because in one of the classes that I'm teaching now, I've been teaching, you know, first I taught uh, persuasion and rhetoric. And at the beginning of the class, I like, okay, here's what a Christian worldview is. And I, I kind of assumed that most of the students knew, but no, I was really surprised that that was something that we're continuing to develop, which I was really grateful. And I, I want to also say this. I never heard the term Christian worldview, and I'm not exaggerating, probably until about 2013, 2014. Yeah. No one, I went to a Christian college. I went to seminary. The word Christian worldview is something that never resonated with me. It was not something that was talked about at all. Yeah. And so the first time I heard someone talking about it, I was like, what in the world? Like, tell me about this. And so I'm grateful, very grateful that it's Spurgeon. And that is the key thing. Like we began that class with the, we are going to use the Christian worldview to understand what is taught yeah. here in the content. Yeah. And I mean, uh, we did have an episode with, uh, I'm trying to think of her name it started with a U and it was a long name, but uh, she did. Uh, yeah. Urbanowitz. Yeah. That's yes, right. Urbanowitz. Yeah. yeah and, we, and I mean, she was talking about uh, worldview education, education and yeah. stuff like that. So it's, it's a, it's a big deal. Yes. Um, I mean, we're talking about our kids and stuff like that. And there, you know, there's a reason why um, my kids are going to like, you know, kids corner and, and uh, Gloria Deo respectively is because of the recognition that there is a worldview issue in education. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're like history. You can't look at history. I mean, you can look at data, but there it's interpreted, right? Yeah. So we all recognize that um, history is interpreted, but then there's thing, there's something there um, that we, that has to be discussed whenever we look at data. So it could be historical data. It could be stuff that you dig up in the ground. It could be stuff that, you know, you read the Bible or you talk to somebody, um, what, whatever it is, you know, this, this worldview thing is a big deal. And so, you know, whenever you listen to Albert Moeller mm -hmm. in the briefing from a Christian worldview, That's you know, right. and so like, I mean, so now it's become you know, you know, part of a uh, conversation. I'm glad that seemingly the Christians are the ones that are talking more and using, utilizing that language that I hear secularly. I guess you could say, you know, from, from the non-Christian perspective, I don't hear well, it talked about. And it is evident whenever you actually have conversations, especially if you're well, Dave I'll never I. forget I, uh, when we did the very first debate between you and Sean McCormick, right? Yeah. You said, well, you have a naturalistic, materialistic worldview. And he said, I don't have a worldview. Yeah. That was something that even we ran into in our debate with jd or jt eberhardt yeah. i don't have a worldview that's yeah. false you yeah. do have a way in which you interpret the world where you presuppose things yeah. and everyone has one now do you have an informed worldview do you have a consistent worldview have you even considered the worldview through which you are understanding everything and yeah. that's exactly why this is such an important thing i believe that christians are to have a very biblically informed worldview. And then you get to people like Richard Howe and Adam Tucker who say, well, there's no such thing as a Christian worldview. Yeah. So yeah. it's such it's like, a I don't, weird... I don't have a biblical worldview and he makes a big deal out of it, you know, making videos as yeah. well. So it's not just something that came up in conversation. It's something that he preaches yeah. and, and confesses um, that he doesn't have a worldview. So, 
you know, he's got a worldview or there isn't worldviews. <laughs> yeah. So then yeah. basically our goal today is, and this is a really cool thing. Um, not only do I hope this is a resource for you to use in other places, share this because not only do I believe that the content here is really important, it should be really simple and it should be something that you're able to take in other places. So Adam, Let's pretend that you're a guest. What is a worldview? What is a worldview? And so I don't want to just uh, leave it up to us or whatever. Yeah, I agree. Um, there are tons and tons of resources. There's a lot of stuff to read out there. And reading is awesome. Yes, And so amen. I want to show you guys a great book called Creation Regained from Albert M. Walters. And so let's just uh, kind of see where the academics are going with this. And I mean, this would agree with what we've already um talked about anyway in the past on other episodes, which um, hopefully if you've been with us for a long time, you've, you already know the definition that we're going to use, but uh, let's uh, use somebody we haven't uh, talked to talked about before. But when we think about worldview, let's utilize Walters here. He says that the worldview came into the English language through the German Weltanschung. I think that's how you yeah, say it. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. you are, you've got yeah. your book there, Comet, yeah. back there. Oh, yeah, Comet. Yeah, yeah it's very first year. I don't know the... Uh, Same thing with me, dude. Geborn and all that, you know, when you add the, the G-E in front of words for the things in the past. No I clue. didn't get that far, but anyway, <laughs> um, uh, so this So basically, it's saying that there's a word here, Weltanschung, worldview. Um, now, this is a, keeping it distinct from philosophy. Um, in the German language, so that's there. There, this is before philosophy. This is what we're going to be talking about. Is there is a pre-issue and an an a priori issue, uh, something beforehand. So we're we're used to thinking in doing something and then the results. So that's yeah. a posteriori, right? We're talking about a priori's, and so a lot of people um, have been thinking that you know they they do say science or whatever, right? Yeah, and they come to a result, and then there there's the truth, oh. right? Well, the thing is, is they're unconscious to the fact that they're starting from somewhere. And so this is what we're talking about. So it's not philosophy. Um, it's before philosophy say that, but there's a, uh, um, it's, it's a word used um, to not be cumbersome saying world and life view. Um, but it's a, what I like here is what uh, Albert says is that it's synonymous with say life perspective. That's right. Or uh, what I really like it, that he says is confessional vision. And this is really uh, yeah, important to the Christian. Confessional vision. Okay? But yeah, confessional vision, um, something that somebody confesses. Um, so it, he goes on to say a Marxist would call this an ideology or secular sciences could call this a, uh, a system of values. Now, that's something that's probably a little bit more um, understandable for uh, just a normal audience, a system of values. So we're so saying ideology, values if and a, a system of them. Yeah. Ideology if you're a Marxist, yeah. system of values if you're just like a materialist. Or just, you know, you're not considering, you, you, you're you unconscious to your religiousness nature. Gotcha. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, you know, you use system of values. We, we can definitely agree on that, but we're talking about worldview, world and life view. And so um, to get down to a definition here, it says worldview um, will be defined, um, and this is where we would agree, um, our worldview, here's our definition, is the comprehensive framework of one's basic basic beliefs about things. So essentially worldview is the filter through which you make sense of the reality and the experiences around you. Yeah. Yeah. And so, that would be why we could say objectively, everyone has a worldview because we're trying to process the sense and the, even the spiritual elements that around us and surround us. And even yeah. the one who rejects by pure starting place, anything beyond the physical universe, if they start there, they're still making making sense of the world around yeah. them through some framework. Yeah. And so we're talking about like, again, like I said, a priori, something that comes before. And so like also, you know, this is uh, where we have mentioned it. And I'm glad that this book came out uh, against all opposition. Um, defending the Christian worldview. It was put together by Gary DeMar, um, but it's a collection of works that were audio files um, from Greg Bonson put into book form. And now this is a great starting point if you want to get into the Bonson train of thought, the Vantillian train of thought, the covenantal presuppositional train of thought. This is something actually easy and more conversational to read to yeah. get to it. But anyway, this is the uh, definition that we've always utilized, that we've utilized in debate. I think whenever we uh, went in with J.T. Everhart, this mm -hmm. was the 
definition that I talked about, um, talking about rationality in the, in worldview in that one. But, um, just again, just to put it out there, um, I like Walter's definition, but this one gets a little bit more clarity. Um, I think Bonson did well saying a network of presuppositions that are not tested by natural science in terms of which all experiences are related and interpreted. That includes presuppositions about the nature of God and man and the world and how we know what we know and what we're supposed or how we're supposed to live our lives. So what we need to understand is before you do the scientific method, there is a framework yes. that is untested by that method that you go into that method. So we're talking about a priori's here, the starting points. So I like the way that James Sire in his book, the universe next door sets it up and it's a very simple thing. And I kind of want to unpack his definition because I think it's a very simple one. The universe next door is generally a very well used worldviews catalog textbook, right? Yeah. At a lot of seminaries and a lot of undergraduates that act in undergraduate classes that study worldview. Uh, can't wait in seminary. I will have a class just called worldview Christian worldview. So it'll, it'll be a great one, but here's what Sire says in the universe next door. Sire suggests that a worldview is a commitment, a story or set of presuppositions, assumptions that may be true, conscious, consistent, and the foundation on which we live. So I guess what we might want to say is, uh, and ask, why is it important as Christians? Like, do we have a u unique perspective on worldview? And, and why is it important for us to have a well-constructed worldview? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, it totally makes sense, especially uh, whenever we consider Scripture. Um, yeah. Whenever we get into it, whenever we read it, um, you know, we are called to live consistently within it. The outside world wants to point out hypocrisy all the time, right? Why are they doing that? It's because they even recognize there's got to be consistency Yes. because they're, well, if you get into the scriptures, again, being consistent with it, they're image bearers. And uh, they recognize they, again, as we've talked about that suppressed truth ball will pop up. Yes. They can't help it. It's going to pop up and expose itself and you can be there. See right there. That doesn't comport with your worldview, but my worldview. Right. Um, and so it's very important whenever we consider the scriptures. And so, you know, going to Romans 12. Boom, uh, I'm glad you did hope, that. That's what I yeah, went to in my yeah, notes too. Yeah. yeah. So Romans 12 is a big issue here with Paul. He's there. It says, therefore, I urge you brothers on account of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sac or as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service and worship. So worldview is going to, as we go here, is a part of worship to God. Yes. Because it's being a, a spiritual sacrifice. So it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that has epistemological implications Yes, on how we know what we know. And so we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Then you will be able to test, right? You'll know the truth, right? And then you'll be able so, to test because why? Logic yes. presupposes what? Logic presupposes truth. So you have to be able to presupposes test. a God who communicates at least to me, but yeah. 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 So it's one of those things. So when we get in there to, so we're able to test and approve what is good well, and pleasing and perfect. I, and that's why I want to stop real quick. Yeah. Though Christian worldview right now is making a distinct categorical difference. It's saying you cannot accurately test and approve or discern. Yeah. Unless you have a transformed and renewed mind. Yeah. So the Christian worldview makes a declaration anyways. God's word makes a declaration about the Christian mind yeah. and its ability. Prior to that, being able to test and discern what is true and what is right and what is pleasing to the Lord yes. doesn't exist. And it Sorry. seems as though as this implies, you know, do not be conformed to this world, that there's something antithetical yes. in the world to what he's saying being renewed in mind, right? And so we know, I mean, just if you constantly listen to the show, um, you know, Romans 1, 18 through 32, we're darkened. Um, we know the truth. We're suppressing the truth. God has handed us over to that darkness to do everything that we want to do. That's depraved. Yeah. Because again, our insights are going to work against ourselves until we callous ourselves against what we do know is wrong. So we can continue to do those things that are wrong. And so, um, but basically let's, you know, continue on here is for by grace, the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Why? Because God exists and you're his creature. Yes. So you, so why having a Christian worldview is important and, uh, and knowing how to, how the scriptures inform that worldview and how that 
gets, you know, how, how reality is. Reality is you're a derivative creature. And so you shouldn't think more highly than you ought. Um, but think of yourself with sober judgment. Well, sober judgment demands a standard to be able to know if you're sober or not and you're making good judgment according to the measure of the faith that God has given you again, received. It's received that you haven't done this yourself. So this is all a work of God. And so this is why worldview talk is important. This is why we need to go, hey, there's stuff going on before you even get out well, of bed in the it's morning. It's important because the reality is we already, everyone has made some type of a commitment. Yeah. Again, to use more Bonson terms, Van Tillian terms, they have already assumed things. They've made presuppositions, right? Yes. Before they began. So the reality is each and every person, even if they haven't thought through their worldview, they've made these commitments to a worldview. Yeah. Yeah. According and to so, scripture, it's one that leads to death, but yeah. Before, so like yeah. you walk into a house, right? You've never been into this house before, but mm -hmm. you know, you make the assumption that this is a house like any other house and you walk into it hoping to, you know, not fall through the floor. You don't see the floor joist, right? But you assume they're there so that when you walk into that house that has a basement, you're not going to fall through the floor because you assume that the wood is okay, that it's structurally sound, that nobody, you know, whoever lets you in wouldn't let you into it. You know, so there's a lot of assumptions we make um, in, in that we just, and we move in. And that's what we want to talk about are those foundations. And I think, you know, that's a Van Til sort of, um, analogy, uh, but there are foundational things that we assume to be able to move. Well, let me like kind of flesh one out a little bit, yeah. you know, again, <clears throat> I am a communication instructor. Um, Adam and I have written some things that we hope to have published before too Sometime. long. We're going to go speak at conferences here soon. And so the spoken written word is a vital piece to the Christian worldview. Yeah. What does it mean to unpack or to understand that commitment, right? That communication or spoken yeah. word, written word is so important. Well, we have a presupposition, a commitment that the words that we say actually mean something. Mm -hmm. And they actually matter and they should actually be truthful. Well, where yeah. do we get that idea? And that meaning will transcend. Yes. As well. Scripture tells us that God is one who speaks truth, only mm -hmm. truth. Acts 6, 18. He can't lie. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. In other words, we've already made a pre-commitment. Any Christian, even if they haven't really thought about their worldview, they've made a pre-commitment to this idea that words have meaning, that words matter, and that, of course, they do transcend. Um, it's an incredible piece. So there is a very serious commitment. But let's also kind of unpack that when you look at someone who has more of a naturalistic universe, materialistic universe. They've made a commitment, too. Yeah, because the, the first thing you got to answer is when you say that all things are a matter in motion governed by time and chance, how do you know that? Yes. You're making a claim. Now, the, un the unfortunate thing is since worldview hasn't been talked about schools have taught education they systems don't. have taught that without going we're we don't have to go any backwards from that everything's just natural everything just occurs because of time and chance yes and they start there and then we're supposed to get to you know the big stuff from there but no that is an assumption about what people have seen with their eyes and smelled with their nose and heard with their ears and tasted with their tongue. Right. So <clears throat> in, in that sense, you know, from the authority of hu evolved human brains over time because of chance, well, we make the claim that everything is natural matter in motion. And chance. the reality is when you say there is the only things that exist is matter emotion, the materialistic universe, you've actually made a spiritual statement at the same yeah. time, by the way. Mm -hmm. So the reality is if all that exists within the world is the naturalistic materialistic world, can you be consistent with your commitment? And yeah. that's where the problem lies. How do you test your presuppositions? How do you test your commitments? Especially so, whenever we've developed logic that says you can't be circular, right? Yeah, exactly. And so in a naturalistic universe, then you can point out the circularity of reason. 
But, so it's yeah. commitment. But the also the other thing about worldviews, according to Sire, which that I really like, is he says that they're expressed in a story or a set of presuppositions. Yeah. So a <clears throat> worldview is not a story itself, but it it tells a story, uh, some type of grand narrative, right? Uh, for example, the grand narrative, the story that would be said in the materialistic universe is that uh, all that exists is that matter in motion or the result of random chance. No objective truth exists, right? Truth is merely in the mind. And so the story of or the grand narrative of any world view is one that's trying to say, here's what the world means, yeah, right? So whenever Carl Sagan comes out, on the cosmos and says, we are all just stardust. What does that presuppose then? That's what you got to look for. The presupposition. And can yeah. you be consistent with yeah. that narrative? Does that narrative play out in some type of meaningful, consistent way? Or yeah. do you have to switch parts of the story in order to make it work? Or do you have to borrow from someone else's narrative yeah. in order to make it work. Yeah, and by I'm, that, I'm yeah. go for it. Yeah. And that's to say, you know, if I'm just stardust, then why is it even important that I know it? Well, and here's the thing. And if yeah. we're just stardust, why do I have to borrow from someone else's narrative by importing some idea that, well, that person has special stardust? Well, wait a second. If we're all stardust, then no stardust is greater than any other stardust. So it doesn't really matter. So you can't even be consistent with yeah. your grand narrative. That's the problem. You trace it back to that. And again, the Christian worldview says that the triune God of the, the triune God who is the creator of the universe existed uh, before creation, he is the creator and things have meaning because he has authority over his creation. Yeah. I like what the universe next door says and when it says Christians see their lives and the lives of others is tiny chapters in the master story. It's because we have that set of presuppositions or presupposed truths. We're able to answer life's most basic questions according to those fundamental Grand, that fundamental grand narrative, in other words. Yeah. How do we see that grand narrative playing out? What has meaning as a result of that? Yeah, and, and it's one of those things that if you are from another worldview other than the Christian worldview, like you're demanding answers. But again, like I said, why is it important? Like if, we, if I am just artist, why is it even important for me to know? Yeah. You know, so like why, why are we pushing um, education? Why are we pushing for peace? Why are we pushing for all this kind of stuff? Whenever I'm just stardust, you're just stardust. And, you know, why is it important that, you know, it survives? And why is it my my form of a collection of matter? Why, why does it matter that we survive? Because remember, if it's true, dinosaurs were from 65 million years ago, an asteroid comes, hits into the Earth, all the dinosaurs die, and guess what still happened? The Earth spun, the sun still comes up, sun goes down, rain, snow, sleet, all that stuff so far has been uniform as far as we know, I guess. Right. right. You know, like, you know, so then you, it's just, why, why don't, why is it, why can't I just go into apathy? Why can't I just kill myself? Why can't I just kill you? Or why and should I do problem. good for Those anyone? Are the answers. Those right. are the like, answers. And so they're f wanting to find answers just for the sake of answers. But the Christian worldview goes, I look for answers because I made I the know. image of God. Bingo. Because he talks. Because he speaks, he wants to have a relationship. There's a transcendent relationship we're supposed to have. So that's why we try to leap out of ourselves and go up. Unfortunately, though, God has come down because we can't know him otherwise. Yeah. So, again, another element that I think is incredibly important for the Christian worldview is this reality that we do make assumptions that may be true, conscious, and consistent. In other words, every worldview makes assumptions that might actually be right or wrong, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just because you believe something to be true and your worldview believes something to be true, you have to have some measure by which to validate that it is true. Does that make yeah. sense? The worldview has to be consistent within its truth claims, right? And even make the assertion that this 
should be or could be true, right? There's almost a testable aspect of a worldview. Mm. When you think about it in that terms, you can make assumptions based on that worldview and test those hypotheses in a way, if that, if that yeah. makes sense. And so you're talking about uniformity, huh? There you go. Uh, those who like to say they reject objective truth, for example, uh, make a massive inconsistency within their piece. So that worldview, the atheistic, naturalistic worldview, or any worldview that would make the assumption, we've seen it in, in your basic philosophy class, objective truth doesn't exist. Okay, you've just yeah. already pointed yourself to the fact that your worldview made an assumption that according to itself fails. So that worldview thereby needs to be rejected because yeah. it cannot be consistent. Mm -hmm. um, again, it comes to that same thing about human value and dignity, right? What is the measure by which we are able to give value to those things? Do your assumptions about why? And this is the one thing I think that is, we found this in one of our debates, uh, the second atheist debate, right? Mm -hmm. Where the guy said, what do, why do I have to account for human dignity? Yeah. Because you've assumed it. Yeah. If you assume it, but your worldview doesn't assume it. And that, again, shows the living on borrowed capital element of yeah, a and worldview. It's, and it's one of those things that I've noticed that it's not just like, it's blatant bar, borrowed capital now. It's, you know, we have to have the conversation as mm -hmm. to, you know, it's, it's only the Christian worldview but it's one of those blatant things that happened in the debate and it happened even with Chris Hitchens and uh, Doug Wilson. Yeah. Um, where stuff like that is asked and then they have to look to the crowd and they go, well, what do you think? You know, like whenever we were talking, I think Ray Lampart like, yeah. did that. Like you guys want to live in a society like this, don't you? And it's like, he doesn't have an answer to account for it. So he has to go, but what do you? So mm -hmm. no matter who he's going to, he's got to borrow. You well, want to live in this. And that's the arbitrary nature of yeah. that as well. So this is yeah. the problem. If, if according to the naturalistic atheist or just the naturalistic worldview, if human beings have dignity in one essence, when do they, and when do you get to decide when they don't have value and dignity, yeah. right? That becomes the arbitrary nature of it. And again, Christians need to be very careful about this. And this is why we've been so adamant about abortion. Because if we're consistent about life having value, that God is the creator of life, we can't say, well, then let's just make it harder for people to commit murder. That's yeah. not how it works. Yeah. If we truly believe that that's life, then that is life, not because we've said so. And oh, by the way, we need to go back and repent as Southern Baptists in, for what we did in 1973. We stepped out on the wrong foot. Yeah. That's the thing. And oh man, that just, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm taking a little <laughs> bit of a rabbit trail here. Yeah. But when they said, why do we need to repent for this? Yeah. Wait one second. Yeah, How dare you say that yeah. why we need to repent? Because we started on the wrong foot. Yeah. Yeah. And then so, you know, so where, where do you get that human dignity from? Is it inherent? And why, why would our founding fathers write a document saying that we have an, an like inherent rights and an unalienable mm -hmm rights that were given to us like so why did our why did our uh, founding fathers like say that that there are something inside of us that nobody can take away nobody makes a definition and it's one of those things like i understand and this is this is why worldview is important is because yes there were atheists that came over here to america there were deists whatever right but what were they borrowing from who was over here too puritans nobody Christians? Yeah. And here's the issue with that. Nobody has the right to be arbitrary. This is where we actually demonstrate to me as a uh, believer, we demonstrate within that incrementalist approach yeah. to abortion arbitrariness. Yeah. Because you're actually celebrating, oh, hey, babies are still getting killed, but we're going to celebrate that we, we made it a little bit harder. Yeah. But wait a second, I thought you were trying to stop babies from getting killed. Murder is not like a halfway thing. According to the Christian worldview, evil is evil. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so if you're actually standing up, you're trying to stop evil. And so there's this massive set of arbitrariness. Oh, we're going to celebrate when we've just made it a little bit harder to kill people. No, no, the very fact that you are killing people murder. is the problem. Yes, the very fact that you're allowing murder yes. and Christians can't allow that. And here again, thank you, Missouri Baptist Convention. We just pretended like we did some type of abolitionist yeah. resolution and it's not. Again, words have meaning. <laughs> exactly. Thank because, you so yeah, much. Yeah. I love what uh, Lyle yeah. says in the ultimate proof of creation. In logical reasoning, no one is permitted to be arbitrary. That is, we cannot simply assert a claim that has no reason behind it and expect others to accept that claim. Our beliefs must have justification. Rational debate would be impossible if the two opponents decided that they didn't need to give a reason for their position. Yeah. Therefore, while all worldviews make assumptions none of them have the right to be arbitrary no worldview is viable if it cannot justify its claims its assumptions and yeah. prove itself to be uh consistent yeah Good and so point. this is the other little thing and then again i like this too and thanks for letting me kind of unpack some of these oh, yeah. things by the way you got lots of stuff oh yeah um likewise a worldview is the foundation upon which we live. Mm -hmm. This is the part that's often unarticulated by many people. They're operating on a foundational assumptions and they're making assertions, but they have not articulated the foundation upon yeah, that's, which that's they a, live. Again, that's the a priori issue is that whenever you, like even the naturalists, did they, did they come to the solution, come to the conclusion after the fact, but if they came yeah. that if they came to naturalism after the fact, what did they start with? Yes, they started with nothing. Then, <laughs> from their own worldview, they had no starting point. They were mindless. Yes. So, what does that actually mean? They started with it. Well, and that's the issue when it comes to evaluating your worldview. Mm -hmm. Here's where the real kicker is. And I believe why the Christian worldview actually can evaluate itself. Because unless you have transcendent knowledge, you cannot evaluate the system that you are stuck in. Yeah. And this is sort of, this is an admission that finally came up in a conversation, um, you know, with, with my online buddy. Yeah. Is, uh, you know, I was like, I have a worldview, you have a worldview, you know, you're here, I'm here, where's the... Uh, you know, what transcends us to say who is right or wrong. And he had to admit that there was nothing. So again, that's... So there's you know, no means by which you can evaluate yeah, so that. So you have two opposing worldviews, and there is nothing outside here. So where do you go? Power. That's but it's exactly what the world hates right now, is power. <laughs> it's, no, see? Once... Again, yeah, it's everything's going to refute itself if it doesn't start with the triune God that has revealed himself in the scriptures. Yeah. And in here, you know, by creation. So Rob Phillips has this great little document. And of course, it is likewise something that is available in the class that I teach online, uh, communication theory, when we talk through worldview. And uh, what, what Sire does in his book, the universe next stories, he says there's basically eight questions that every worldview has to answer. So put you on the spot. I'm going to give you these questions. Let's see if you can be consistent with a Christian worldview or tell me how a Christian worldview would answer these questions. We'll see you and me. What is prime reality? What is really real? Prime reality. What is that even? Oh, from a nat that those are immaterial words and I'm yes. a naturalist, so they don't exist. There is no prime reality then. It's objectively true that there is no objective truth. So there is nothing that is really real. Nothing is real. There you go. The Christian worldview says <laughs> prime reality is that the triune God of yeah. the triune God exists and created us. He revealed himself in scriptures. Um, he is transcendent, he is eminent, he is omniscient, he is sovereign, he is good. What is really real? what God declares to be real. Yeah. And so it's, but it's not what he just declares. All right. He That's has true. made it. Yes. And he has explained it. So it's not because, you know, it's, it's not in the sense of, you know, once you find out it, then it's true or, you know, God was explaining something that was made before, you know, before mm -hmm. he claimed it. 
you know, no, no, no. He yes. created it. You know, so the, the presupposition of scripture is what it starts with in the beginning God. Right. And before that, before that's, he is before all things. Yes. So then he makes all things. So he's not a part of the creation. He exists outside of creation. So this is where you get transcendence. But then there is cre creation and then he messes inside of it. So he's imminent as well. So he's, you know, he's, so we're not just talking about a deity that's aloof or can't interact. Um, and we're not talking about everything in this being God, that God is included and enclosed in this circle. And that's why there's the Vantillion two circles with a line between them for that's the covenantal revelation. That's yeah. how we know. So the other question that Van, T not Van Til, sorry, that Sire asked is what is the nature of external reality? That is the world around us. What's the nature of the world around us? Soli Deo Gloria. So everything's reflecting God's uh, God's eternal nature. It says in uh, Romans one eighteen through, or isn't yeah in Romans one eighteen through thirty two is included in the fact that that's how God has made Himself known, is that His He has shown it to us because everything, including man as creation, screams His glory, His eternal well, and power, then to and me, His divine nature. Yeah, to me that's a beautiful picture of what is the nature of external reality that it's created that it has a creator yeah. that it do, does not independently exist yeah that it is derivative bingo there you go yeah number three he asked what is a human being what is a human being well from a christian worldview from a christian, a christian worldview, worldview yeah let's a, go there someone that is made you someone that is male or female sorry yeah to right on sorry to be binary but you know, our computer, I'm not sorry to be binary. The computers we are using are so. I guess you know maybe that's reflecting something. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought about that. <laughs> but anyway, no, it's a male or female created in the image of God uh, as a creature, but possesses communicable attributes because that's mm. the way God made them. So to have dominion, to subdue the earth, to be fruitful and multiply, to worship God, you know, to be in communion with God. You know, that's, that's a human being. So you know that this podcast, I'm linking my students to the YouTube page. Right. So, you know, hopefully, I mean, it's just going to be each time when I post, they're going to get to see cool. this if they want to watch it as another resource. Number four, what happens to a person after death? Every worldview makes an assumption, tells part of the narrative, makes some type of a yeah. statement about this. What happens to a person after death? So do we get, okay. Essentially, what is creation? Mm. What are human beings? Yeah. What does all of this mean, essentially? But but what happens to a person after they die? According to a Christian worldview, we've got a clear picture of that. Yeah, yeah, it's a clear picture. Is is that if you are in Christ, that you well, before the consummation of the kingdom, if you die, you go to paradise to be with Him, and enjoy that existence until Christ comes and you are reunited. The cool thing is, is you get your body back. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. Isn't that awesome? You get to be you. That's a cool, you're not like, you're not in some ethereal cloudy experience, but you're with Christ. He said, uh, where I go, you know, I'm building a place for you and you'll be with me. So where I go, you will be able to come. Like he has again, brought into relationship a people with himself. And so where do we go? So before he comes, we get to go be in paradise. But eventually um, what we get to see is a recreated creation. So God made it good from the beginning. So talking about creation, he made it good from the beginning. It got screwed up by us, but he doesn't hate his creation. He loves his creation. He's mm -hmm. redeeming creation. So we'll have a new heavens and a new earth where we'll experience God forever. Why is it possible to know anything at all? Why is it possible to know anything at all? Because God has spoken. Amen. That's pretty easy. Yeah. He's given us minds that reason. He's given he's us the starting point us. that we can yeah. actually have knowledge and, and trust our with, and trust yeah. the reasoning that we have. So either sure. we're assuming that our reasoning is valid using our reasoning, which is circular, or which since we're not ultimate reality, so we can't make an ultimate claim like that. So it is fallacious. If we use our reasoning to validate that our reasoning is valid or going to another person going, trusting that their, trusting that their reasoning is valid because they have 
<laughs> they, well, that's the, the really knowledge. interesting yeah, thing. Yeah. So it's either an echo chamber of gobbledygook or it's based on an ultimate authority who knows all things and has spoken the truth about it. Well, that kind of answers that next idea mm. is how do we know what is right and wrong? So yeah. this is where you see a massive inconsistency between a Christian worldview and a naturalistic worldview. Naturalistic worldview, it's whatever society says, it's always changing. There is no ultimate objective right or wrong. Yeah. Other worldviews generally deviate upon those things, right? Yeah, well, I mean, if you were, were in election time, we we're getting the president, um, he's going to be on this uh, side called progressive. So when you hear the word progressive, what do you mean? it means you're going somewhere, right? Like yeah. you're, you're progressing. progressing, you have progress, so it means you're going somewhere. But if you are always in flux, I guess you're always going somewhere. But what are you progressing to? Progress- or progressing from. Yeah. So what what does that term mean? But if the triune God exists and there is actual meta narrative and there is a beginning and there is an end, that makes sense of progress. But it's definitely not the progress that the progressives are talking about. Yeah. I mean, they recognize that they there is a need for utopia. That's the Marxist idea is that mm. there's got to be a utopia. But is it going to be found in a scale? a world of scarcity and fallenness. Oh wait, but people aren't fallen. But oh wait, people are just bags of protoplasm governed by time and chance. And we, in this governed by time and chance stardust bags are trying to control what created them. So they don't even, they can't, they have to reject their own worldview. They hate it. Yes. But then they've got nothing to go to unless if they make Jesus their Lord. That's right. Last two little pieces. What yeah. is the meaning of human history? The meaning of human history. Well, is there any meaning in human? We just do stuff. The Christian right? worldview. We just do stuff, and then we record stuff, and then us now thinks those guys back in the past were stupid, and we laugh at them, and then, then usually, well, I guess if there is a oh, oh the ball's popping up, I notice a pattern. Yeah. <laughs> oh crap! You know. But, so, but yeah, there is meaning to history because there is a beginning. And there is an end. Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the yeah, Omega, the right. beginning and the end, the first and the last. And so in him are all things. Um, there's a meaning to history because God is working in history from the very beginning and to the end of this. But then again, there is a forever history awaiting us. So That's right. All right, last one. Adam, thank you so much, man. I'm so grateful that you would do this topic with me Anytime. and allow me to kind of lead in the in the discussion on it. Uh, what personal life orienting core commitments are consistent with this worldview? What personal life orienting core commitments are consistent with this worldview? <clears throat> Van Til. I can't stop talking about Van Til. But my I know that's a great book. I'm going to try to find that book sometime. I mean, uh, I, I am going to make sure I get against all odds and Creation regained. Those are yeah. books I'm all throwing into a class that I'm taking. Here we go. If Christ is who he says he is, then all speculation is excluded, for God can swear only by himself. So God's commitment to himself is the sole commitment. Now, my commitment is to find out what man is and who God is. One can only go to Scripture, faith, and the self-attesting Christ of the scriptures is the beginning, not the conclusion of wisdom. Mm. Love it. Glorify so my God commitment is forever. to the self-attesting Jesus Christ who came, who is God, made flesh, dwelled among us, has made a way of salvation, becoming the propitiation for sins. He became sin, who knew no sin, so that I can have his righteousness, right? So I can be made righteous, so I can be at peace with God through Christ and eventually be able to enjoy him forever. Adam, we have not been able to be in the studio. I think it's been over a month. Like I don't I didn't look, but it's, uh, it's been, been a while. Yeah. It's been a while. I'm glad to be here with you and I'm glad to get to record. This is a meaningful and useful thing. 
I hope that this discussion on worldviews is something that will bless you and encourage you and something that you'll share with others. Mm -hmm. um, we're grateful. We've had two different people make nice donations to yeah, thank you. tag thank you your guys. it. And we're not going to announce names because they didn't give us permission to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They Well, I mean, neither one did. So um, thank you guys, both of you who did that. Very kind, generous donations. We're really grateful for that. We will be back next week. Likewise, tomorrow night, I will be at First Baptist Church Len mm -hmm. preaching to a, or not preaching, speaking to a group of pastors about critical race theory and why it matters. So yeah. if you are seeing this live or listening to it before tomorrow, be praying for happen. me. Adam has actually <laughs> helped me a great deal. And while I'm there, I'm going to be giving away some books. So if you're yeah. around the area, come and uh, I'll have a few books for you. I'll have a book that I'm going to try to give to everyone. Yeah, and, there's, uh, there's so, one and just, uh, we haven't talked about it in a while, but uh, yeah. Dave does have a book. And hey, I get to do the, uh, I know, I got to do I the know. forward in the second and, edition man, anyway. But yeah, Invasion of the Word Snatchers, great book uh, to get started on again. And uh, I think, yeah, it's uh, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses we and need to, Freemasonry. Yeah, we, we need got to, to do Freemasonry before Masonry I did. Thing. But anyway, yeah, yeah there's some uh, good, uh, just good, um, easy reading here to talk about language. Because words have meaning. That's right. And so this is a, you know, we, this is pertinent to talk about worldview anyway, but yeah, this is available, I think on Amazon still. Yes, it and still is. If you need one, we got a few. Yes. And, uh, we will probably republish it through Baptist and reform publishing. Yeah, our publishing. We someday. need to do that. Someday. And we, uh, will likewise, we've got our, our little booklet. We, yeah. I was looking through it the other day. We'll have, we'll have it done. Yeah, My and then I've got to write inerrancy something. booklet is like, Pray for me that I'll get it done. Yeah. I mean, I'm right there, but it's just been kind of hard with the class that I'm doing. Yeah. With that said, we are so glad that you were able to join us tonight. This is the Tag Your It podcast. I'm Ray Ray. I'm Dave. And so is Dale. Gloria. <laughs> <laughs>